wild, unexhausting labor. And then the soma ration and games and unrestricted copulation and the feelings. <sighs> what more can they ask for? True, they might ask for shorter hours. The inventions office is stuffed with plans for labor-saving processes, thousands of them. But we don't want to change. Every change is a menace to stability. Every discovery is potentially subversive. Even science must sometimes be treated as a possible enemy. What? But we're always saying that science is everything. It's a hypnopedic platitude. Uh, and all the science propaganda we do at college. Yes, but what sort of science? Our science is just a cookery book with a list of recipes that mustn't be added to except by special permission from the head cook. Well, I'm the head cook now. <laughs> but I was an inquisitive young scullion once. I started doing a bit of cooking on my own, unorthodox cooking, illicit cooking, a bit of real science, in fact. Uh, what happened? <sighs> Very nearly what's going to happen to you young men. I was on the point of being sent to an island. You can't send me. I haven't done nothing. Oh, please, don't send me to Iceland. Give me another chance. Please, please, give me another chance. Oh, please, your fortune, please. Not to Iceland. Yes, controller. Bring three men and take Mr. Marks into a bedroom, give him a good soma vaporization, and then put him to bed and leave him. No, please. Not Iceland, no. No, you can't. It's not fair. One would think he was going to have his throat cut. Whereas, if he had the slightest sense, he'd understand that his punishment is really a reward. He's being sent to an island. That's to say, he's being sent to a place where he'll meet the most interesting set of men and women to be found anywhere in the world. I almost envy you, Mr. Helmholtz. Then... Then why aren't you on an island yourself? Well, because, finally, I chose this and let the science go. And sometimes I rather regret the science. Happiness is a hard master, particularly other people's happiness. But it's universal happiness that keeps the wheels steadily turning. Truth and beauty can't. People used to talk about truth and beauty as though they were the sovereign goods right up to the time of the Nine Years' War. That made them change their tune. Yes. After the Nine Years' War, people were ready to have even their appetites controlled. Anything for a quiet life. And we've gone on controlling ever since. It hasn't been very good for truth, of course. But one can't have something for nothing. Happiness has got to be paid for, and that's how I pay. By the way, Helmholtz, would you like a tropical climate? The Marquesas, for example, or Samoa, or something rather more bracing? No, no, I should like a thoroughly bad climate. I believe one would write better if the climate were bad, if there were a lot of wind and um, storms, for example. I like your spirit, Helmholtz. I like it very much indeed. What about the Falkland Islands? Yes, yes, I think that will do. Good. Now, if you don't mind... Uh, perhaps you would run along and see how poor Mr. Marx is getting. Yes. Mm. So, art, science, you seem to have paid a fairly high price for your happiness. Anything else? Well, religion, of course. There used to be something called God. Uh, before the Nine Years' War. But I was forgetting. You know all about God, I suppose. Let me show you something. Yes. It's a subject that has always had a great interest for me. You've never read this, for example. The Holy Bible, containing the Old and New Testaments. Nor this... The imitation of Christ. Nor this. The varieties of religious experience by William James. And I've got plenty more. A whole collection of pornographical books. But if you know about God, why don't you tell them? 
Why don't you give them these books about God? Because they're old. They're about God. Hundreds of years ago. Not about God now. But God doesn't change. Men do, though. Take this book, for example, by a philosopher, if you know what that was. Yes. A man who dreams of fewer things than there are in heaven and earth. Quite so. I'll read you one of the things he did dream of. They say that it is the fear of death and of what comes after death that makes men turn to religion as they advance in years. But my own experience has given me the conviction that we turn to God because we feel the need to lean on something that abides, something that will never play us false, a reality an absolute and everlasting truth. Yes, we inevitably turn to God, for this religious sentiment is of its nature so pure, so delightful to the soul that experiences it, that it makes up to us for all our other losses. Well, my dear friend, one of the numerous things in heaven and earth that these philosophers didn't dream about was this. Us. The modern world. The religious sentiment will compensate us for all our losses. But there aren't any losses for us to compensate. And what need have we of consolation when we have Soma? Then you think there is no God? No, I think there probably is one. But God isn't compatible with machinery and scientific medicine and universal happiness. That's why I have to keep these books locked up in the safe. People would be shocked but if... But isn't it natural to feel there is a God? Natural? <laughs> My dear sir, one believes things because one has been conditioned. To believe them. All the same, it is natural to believe in God. When you're alone, quite alone in the night, thinking about death. But people are never alone now. We make them hate solitude, and we arrange their lives so that it's almost impossible for them ever to have it. Do you remember that bit in King Lear? The gods are just and of our pleasant vices make instruments to plague us. Doesn't there seem to be a God managing these things, punishing, rewarding? Well, does there? Providence takes its cue from man. Are you sure? The gods are just. Haven't they used his pleasant vices as an instrument to degrade him? Degrade him? <laughs> from what? As a happy hard-working, goods-consuming citizen, he's perfect. But if you allowed yourself to think of God, you'd have a reason for bearing things patiently, for doing things with courage. But there isn't any need for a civilized man to bear anything that's seriously unpleasant. And as for doing things, Ford forbid that he should get the idea into his head would upset the entire social order. What about self-denial, then? Industrial civilization is only possible when there's no self-denial. Self-indulgence up to the very limits imposed by hygiene and economics, otherwise the wheels stop turning. You'd have a reason for chastity. Chastity means passion. Chastity means neurasthenia. And passion and neurasthenia mean instability. And instability means the end of civilization. But, but God's the reason for everything fine and noble and heroic. If you had a God... My dear young friend, civilization has absolutely no need of nobility or heroism. Whether a wars... Whether are temptations to be resisted, objects of love to be fought for or defended. There, obviously, nobility and heroism have some sense. But there aren't any wars nowadays, and the greatest care is taken to prevent you from loving anyone too much. There really aren't any temptations to resist either. And if ever, by some unlucky chance, anything unpleasant should happen, why, there's always Soma 
to give you a holiday from the facts, to reconcile you to your enemies, to make you...